Hello everyone and welcome. Make a cup of your favorite drink and get comfortable because this is a wonderful time for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. IT Professionals, what's the worst case of computer illiteracy that you've experienced? Part 4. I tried to help a woman learn how to use a mouse. She complained that it didn't do anything. So I watched her try to use it. When she moved the mouse, she would look at the mouse. Then she would stop moving the mouse and look back at the screen and say, see, it's not doing anything. It took a while, but I was able to train her to look at the screen and move the mouse at the same time. She complained that the computer makers always want to make everything so hard for no reason. Sweet old lady calls up saying her computer isn't turning on. She's a bright lady, also rich. Knows all of our rates and policies before we even have to explain them. $100 an hour? Yup. $100 same day rush fee? Yup. $30 destination fee? Yup. So if it takes you two minutes to fix the problem, it'll cost me $230. Yup. Okay, come on down. We get there only to discover that everything was hooked up correctly, with one exception. The surge protector, instead of plugging it into the wall, she had plugged it into… itself. Unplug the surge protector from itself, plugged it into the wall. Boom! Computer turns on. Oh my, I'm so embarrassed, as she fetches her checkbook. Hurry along, don't tell my husband. Okay, so this is actually a really good story, meaning it has a happy ending, and I've told it before, but in my entire career, this is probably the most fulfilled and happiest I've ever felt in helping out a person that was computer illiterate. For about four years, I worked at an Apple retail store as a Mac genius. This would have been 2006, early 2010, and though I'm not sure how stringent the requirements for hire are now, at the time, you really did have to know a good bit about troubleshooting and hardware repair to get the gig. In fact, I spent a few weeks in Cupertino as part of my initial training. Anyway, I worked at the Columbia MD store, R168 if I recall correctly, and I was taking appointments like normal. This lady comes in with a G4 iBook, one of the very last, I think it was a 900 MHZ model, and cannot get into the computer. Simple forgotten password stuff, and she was very upfront that she wasn't good with computers, but the files on her computers were really, really important to her. Well, I hooked up a Firewire drive that we had an OS installer image loaded on and reset her password for the account. I noticed the account name was a man's name rather than hers, but didn't think much of it. Anyway, in order to confirm that the reset was successful and to ensure that her files were where she expected them, or to help her if she couldn't find them, as I was certain she had no idea what Spotlight is or how to use it, I booted the machine and logged into the account in question. I noticed something very strange right away. There were a bunch of folders on the desktop with very odd names. For example, there was a folder called I'm thirsty, another called hungry, another called I love you, thank you, etc. These things were all over the desktop. I double click on one of them because I expect there are files inside. However, there's nothing in the folder, but when I clicked on the folder, the OS X voiceover feature immediately read out the name of the folder, I'm hungry, or whichever one I clicked on. The woman started to cry, literally cry, and I assume it was because there were no files in the folder. I was preparing to console her and try to find her files, but she stopped me and thanked me, then explained. This computer was owned by her now deceased husband who'd suffered a pretty severe stroke in the last year or so of his life, and to make communicating with his wife easier, he would click on a folder with the phrase he intended to convey. I'll never for the life of me forget what the woman said to me. She thanked me for giving her back her husband's voice. I have never in my life felt so fortunate to do something that I'd otherwise done a thousand times and never considered as important or even, if truth be told, worthy of my time. That I managed to make this woman so happy really made me rethink a lot of that job and how important it was to people that aren't good with computers. I was like one of four Genie working that day and so she could have been helped by anyone. 
but I feel incredibly lucky that I got to help her. So yeah, she was really bad with computers, but I must have spent about a good hour with her after she got a hold of her emotions, just walking her through the system, showing her stuff, teaching her how to back up pictures of her and her husband, etc. It's the most amazing thing I've ever done, and it is such an insignificant thing in itself. The number one computer illiteracy problem I see is people not understanding how files work. They know how to open stuff in Word or Excel. They don't seem to understand that the files exist outside of these programs. It's a monumental task to ask someone to go to a shared folder, find a file, and double click on it. They always go into Word, File, Open, and Find the File, even if it's a PDF. Not a computer per se, but a mobile phone. I still think it's close enough that my story counts. The guy was reporting his phone not charging. Instantly, I figured I'd just send the guy to the store, but in this case, I'm glad I pretended to play along with troubleshooting the issue. I saved him a trip to the store at least. Me. So what happens when you plug it in? Customer. Nothing. Me. The light doesn't come on showing green or red? Customer. No, nothing. Me. Hmm. Maybe the wall outlet isn't working? Can we try another wall outlet? Customer. Sure, one sec. Nope, nothing. Me. Well, the chances of it being two bad wall outlets going wrong is pretty slim. I'm guessing you didn't have a circuit breaker trip. Customer. Not that I'm aware of. Me. And when you plug it into the phone, the plug is going all the way in? Customer. Yes. Me. But you're seeing nothing on the screen. No lights anywhere on the phone. Customer. Correct. Me. Do you have another charger that might work with this phone? Can we try that? Customer. Sure, one sec. Nope, nothing. Me. Must be the port on the phone then. We'll have to bring it to the store. Will I get the ticket created? How long has this been a problem? Customer. A few hours now. Me. And nothing else happened a few hours ago that you're aware of. Phone didn't fall off a counter or anything? Customer. Well, the power went out. Me. Has it come back on by chance? Customer. Not yet. Me. Well, I think I can save you a trip to the store. You know the phone won't charge unless you have electricity, right? Customer. What? My electricity? No one told me I had to have electricity to charge my phone. Me. You know what, sir? You're probably right. I'm willing to bet no one mentioned that, but I'm glad I was able to clear that up for you. Customer. Who's going to compensate me for the electricity I paid for to use this phone? No one told me anything about this. Things went downhill from there. I work for a software company. One of our people internally called to ask me to make a change to their permissions on the back end of a development system. My group does not have access to these systems, so I advised her to contact the developers. She begged for five minutes for me to make the changes as I told her repeatedly I don't have access to the servers to make that change. The call finally ended. Five minutes later, she came over to my desk and asked me, why can't you just make the change? I replied, I don't have access to that server. You have to contact the developers as I said. She stared blankly at me, the vacuous cavern of her empty skull gently bobbing beneath her bleached hair parted like an imitation of Carrot Top gone wrong. Tears began welling in her eyes as she asked, but why can't you just make the change for me? For the hundredth time. I released the exasperated sigh of a support representative low on coffee and patience, my brain melting from saying the same words ad nausea. Slowly, I strained kind words between clenched teeth. I cannot do that. I cannot access the system. I do not have the permission. This is a development system. I cannot make changes for you because I do not have access to the server. Sudden realization washed across her face like a dam breaking free. Well, why didn't you tell me that before? She pleaded, eyes doe-like in the sunshine of her new revelation. I did! I finally exploded. What do you think I don't have access to the server means? Her face changed to indignation. Well, I am not technical like you. How could I be expected to know what a server is? I stared at her for a moment, contemplating the level of stomach it would take to endure the sound of a human skull giving way to intense strike of an office chair. 
wondered how much force I would need to penetrate the thickness of bone, how many layers of protection her hair provided. Finally, I spoke. You work for a software company. Also, what part of you need to contact the developers do you not get? I think she was waiting for an apology. Epilogue. Ten minutes after she left, she called me. I picked up the receiver and spoke with synthetic honey in my voice. Yes? Hey, Pindaroo. Who do I have to contact again? If you work at a software company, you should know what a server is. Glad this was posted. I've been in IT customer service for some time, and the questions I get on a daily basis are insane. I have too many favorites, but I do have a number one. We normally support hospital staff, doctors, nurses, etc. while they are at work, but we also get calls from home users, the worst. Customers that call from home are only supposed to call us with work-related issues. However, we receive calls all the time about different crap. My AT&T U-verse isn't working, or my Netflix is running very slow, lol. Anyways, we are supposed to politely tell these users that we do not support their personal network or equipment. But in some situations, the customer is so peed or frustrated that we are forced to at least provide a few options for resolution. This lady calls peed. She is on eBay and wants to purchase a new monitor for her PC. She insists she has the money on her card, but eBay will not accept her payment. I troubleshoot a little. Me, what type of card is it? Her, it's my Visa debit card. I just used it earlier today and it worked fine. Me, are you making sure that you selected Visa and typing in the numbers correctly? Her, no, I'm swiping my card and the computer will not read it. Me, swiping your card? You have a credit card device hooked up to your PC? Her, of course, all of the computers have them. I stick my card in the slot and pull it out and it will not read. Long story short, this lady was sticking her debit card into the floppy drive thinking that eBay was going to read her card. She ended up getting it stuck in the PC and wanting us to help get it out. Wow, the crap we deal with is infinite. Early in my career, I received a call from a user having trouble with her 3.5 inch floppy drive. I could hear it grinding away over the phone, so I grabbed a spare and went down to see her. I sat down, popped in a disc, and it read just fine. Puzzled, I asked if I could see the discs she was using. She handed me a disc with a post-it note on it. Not stuck to it. Stapled to it. Apparently, the post-it note kept falling off because they made such good disc labels, so she stapled it right to the disc. Through the casing, through the mag film. I kept that disc in my laptop bag for many years afterward, just so I could pull it out when telling the story. <laughs> IT development of a hospital in the early 2000s. A doctor calls to tell us that his computer isn't working. What's the problem? No idea, but the screen is black. So I walk over to his office to see what's wrong with his desktop. When I arrive, I find a PC that seems fine. The doc tells me the problem is that the computer would just turn off after a couple of minutes. I begin to think I know what the problem is, and since my day wasn't particularly exciting, I suggest that we wait together until the computer stops working. Sure enough, after about five minutes, the PC goes into screen sleep to save the CRT. Before I can explain what is happening here and that it's an intended feature, the doc happily tells me that he found a way to fix this problem whenever it occurs. He proceeds to whack the top of the CRT monitor and I notice that there's already an actual dent in the plastic at the spot. After a couple of blows with intensifying force, the desk shakes enough to move the mouse just a tiny little bit, enough to wake the desktop. If you want to watch the part 3, click the link here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, the likes and the comments. See you in the next video. Thank you.